Imagine a leisurely game of tennis where one wrong move could send you spiraling down over 700 feet to a very certain and painful death. Not for the faint of heart? Unbelievably, this exact scenario actually played out one afternoon back in 2005, when tennis greats Roger Federer and Andre Agassi played a round of tennis on top of sky-high helipad converted grass tennis court, with no fencing or safety boundaries whatsoever. Though pictures, discussions, and ridiculous myths have swirled the internet for years regarding this iconic matchup, little is actually publicly known about the circumstances, logistics, and real reasons behind the event's inception. A story revealed to involve a professional tennis tournament's struggle to stay alive, a man determined to solidify tennis's place in the Middle East, and a personal request from the Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates himself. Brace yourself if you have a fear of heights. Today we're uncovering everything behind the 700-foot tennis marketing stunt heard around and above the world. The city of Dubai, a place now known for its exuberant opulence and futuristic architecture, was in very recent memory not much of a city at all. As a quick geography recap, the city itself is the capital of the Emirate of Dubai one of seven total territories whom collectively make up the country of United Arab Emirates. Located in Western Asia, and governed in part by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. More on him later. As mentioned, Dubai, and the Greater Emirates itself, was a small player on the world stage until the 20th century. Though initially known for the area's thriving pearling industry, a business decimated by World War I and the advent of cultured pearls, the discovery of abundant oil and the country's newfound independence from Great Britain in 1971 set the stage for a second and far more lucrative period of success for the Emirates. In extremely short order, the sparse desert landscapes of the country's wealthiest regions, particularly Dubai, transformed almost overnight into a thriving metropolis. Now, where does the crazy tennis match fit into all of this? Well, it starts with this man. Sensing opportunity from afar, Australian TV producer Jeff Chapman proposed an idea to Dubai executives in the early 90s to raise the city's profile even higher. A one-off tennis exhibition event featuring Martina Navratilova. Though the event itself did not pan out, the idea had enough support to justify the creation of an actual professional men's tournament, the Dubai Tennis Championships, a now world-class event which draws the greatest tennis players to the region every February. A triumphant tournament whose inaugural 1993 edition was in every sense of the term, a total disaster. With no clear direction how to do so, organizers hastily built a tennis center, only to realize the courts themselves were not laid out correctly, as tennis courts must face north-south, not east-west. Upon fixing the courts, the temporary stadium's wooden scaffolding was found to creak heavily every time a person walked up or down the stands. Worse, for a country that hardly receives any precipitation all year, that year's final was postponed due to a massive rainstorm which blew away the tents and stands, completely flooding the stadium. Though the event comparatively fared better over the next 10 years, by 2003 the Dubai Championships were still struggling to gain proper footing in the tennis world, having remained sparsely attended with no high-profile players willing to play. When the tournament came under current director Salah Talak's leadership in 2003, pressures to turn the tournament's fortunes around reached a fever pitch when Talak was paid a visit by who other but the aforementioned ruler of Dubai himself, Sheikh Mohammed. A tennis fan, the ruler questioned why the tournament's stadium seats always appeared empty on TV, and requested better attendance for the following years. With nowhere left to turn but upwards, Talak envisioned a comprehensive plan to elevate the tournament's status above all expectations. A plan to be capped off by a marketing stunt so extreme that it would be impossible for tennis fans not to be talking about tennis in Dubai. All Talak needed was some help from a couple friends. Roger Federer, one of the greatest tennis players of all time, was initially known to Dubai tennis officials as a match tanker? Having arrived to play in Dubai for the first time in 2002, the promising 21-year-old was beaten handily in the second round by German Reiner Schuttler, a lower-ranked player he had himself beaten just a month earlier. Determining the Swiss played far below expectations, Chapman, in his last year of directorship, decided to not only withhold Federer's prize money and appearance bonus, but reported him to the ATP for suspected wrongdoing. Following an investigation, the ATP ordered organizers to pay up the prize money. The appearance money, substantially larger, was held back on the condition that Federer returned in 2003. What began as a hostile association became a blossoming partnership, as Federer in subsequent years would win back-to-back -back Dubai titles and was eventually made tournament ambassador, significantly raising the event's international profile. 
Thanks in further part to Talak and company's hard work at further improving the tournament, such as elevating its status to an ATP 500 event, pushing its dates deeper into February so players wouldn't have to arrive right after the Australian Open, and introducing an equal pay women's draw to coincide with the men, the 2005 Dubai Tennis Championships was poised to be the highest profile edition of the tournament seen to date, with a star-studded cast which for the first time included fan favorite Andre Agassi. Not content with simply relying on billboards and radio adverts to draw attention to the tournament, Talak envisioned a scene sure to put Dubai tennis on the map. Just a year prior, Tiger Woods made headlines by teeing off the helipad of the newly constructed Burj Al Arab, a five-star mega hotel just down the road from the tennis stadium that towered over 1,000 feet into the air. This gave Talak an idea. While not a massive helipad by any stretch, would it be big enough to fit a tennis court? Even if. Would anyone in their right mind agree to play on it? And so it was, after a period of planning, construction, and a couple phone calls, Roger Federer and Andre Agassi arrived at the Burj Al Arab on February 22, 2005, for the hit of a lifetime. To preface, Roger and Andre were forced to act out this hilariously awkward exchange on their way to the court. Hey Andre, how's it going? Hey Roger, what's happening? Yeah, everything's good, so first time for you in Dubai? First time here. Special place, this hotel is amazing. They got a, a court upstairs. Want to hit? Oh, yeah, a special court. Let's go do it. Yeah, let's do that. That'll, huh? be, that'll be a lot of fun. Roger's acting chops aside, the world was then finally introduced to the Sky Court, a specially constructed grass tennis court standing 689 feet above the ground upon Burj Al Arab's extended helipad. Though regulation tennis courts measure 27 feet wide by 78 feet long, this one was reportedly shortened to fit the helipad's dimensions. And no, there's no camera trickery at play. There truly was no fencing or boundary to prevent the tennis balls, or players themselves, from falling off the edge. And judging by promotional video obtained, they weren't afraid to get too close. Regarding the stunt's logistics, Talik has said, it took us about one month to convince both Agassi and Federer to do it, because one of them, I can't remember if it was Federer or Agassi, had a height phobia. Eventually, both of them agreed. Though Talik wouldn't specify, we can make an estimated guess which player he was referring to based on Andre's later recount. This was an absolutely amazing experience. When you first get over how high you are and start playing, it's an absolute joy and it was a great time. I had no issues with the height as long as I didn't have to bungee jump off the side. Though no information has ever been publicly revealed regarding the court's construction process or artificial grass makeup, Talak later revealed that it cost a little less than $25,000 to stage the matchup. Though the stunt could have been done for a lot cheaper, the event wouldn't have came close to having the viral impact it did if not for a request made by Roger Federer himself. I had an idea of how we could make it better. We had a helicopter, which was going to film it all around, really show what kind of platform we were playing on, instead of just having a picture taken from the hotel. It can really tell how high up we are, and I think that made the difference. A difference made, indeed. Promotional photos and video posted online spread like wildfire through news articles, blog posts, and email chains, becoming tennis's first truly viral moment to hit the internet. Then ATP CEO Mark Miles called Talak personally to congratulate him, saying, What you guys have done is great for tennis. Congratulations. You hit half the planet. Though the ATP saw it as a great achievement for tennis, Talak in reflection has viewed the event instead as a proud moment for Dubai, with the match's legacy having given the Dubai Championships the promotional and financial injection it needed to make it the premier event it is today, raising the city's international profile that much further. While at the time just a simple 20-minute hit for a couple players at a cool location, images of the Sky Court spectacle remain deeply ingrained in popular tennis culture to this day, having firmly cemented tennis's place in the Middle East all while capturing people's imaginations worldwide. Now a quick disclaimer, making videos is hard, but I'm sure you already knew that. There's no worse feeling than spending weeks on a new video only for YouTube's algorithm to repress and demonetize it because it didn't like the topic. That's why a bunch of other creators and I built Nebula, a streaming service that allows us to create the content we want without censorship and without ads. You'll find my content there, alongside creators like Wendover, Mike Boyd, MKBHD, and many more. Not only can you watch all of our existing and future content ad-free, but Nebula will be the home of future cult tennis bonus and original content developed exclusively for the platform. Original content like Polyphonic's Dark Side of the Moon project, where he spent eight episodes analyzing every track off Pink Floyd's groundbreaking album. Here's the best part though. I've teamed up with CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video, so that when you sign up for their service using my link down below, you get Nebula included free for as long as you remain subscribed to CuriosityStream, both services for less than $15 a year. 
And why wouldn't you? CuriosityStream offers thousands upon thousands of high-quality and thought-provoking documentaries, including John McEnroe, In the Realm of Perfection, a fantastic film documenting McEnroe's eccentricities and champion-like qualities against the backdrop of his 1984 Roland Garros final against Ivan Lendl, the one Grand Slam he never won. This bundle truly is the best way to support this channel. So while you might not be playing on any 600-foot tennis courts anytime soon, you can start your educational journey today.